The early 2000s were filled with odd films and amazing films. One that should have made more of an impression, yet seems to have somewhat disappeared, is Hollow Man. The film was not a failure at the box office, but many seem to not even know it exists until they stumble upon it on television. How can a film like Hollow Man, starring Kevin Bacon, seemingly vanish from the general population's consciousness? Let's find out on what the f happened to this horror movie. Seeing as many people haven't seen Hollow Man, or have opted to forget it, let's go over the story real quick. The premise is simple. A scientist decides to make himself invisible as a means of human testing the experiments he had previously done on animals. Soon, his personality shifts, and the longer he is invisible, the more evil he becomes. Now, this doesn't just happen overnight. The film opens on a rat being caught by an invisible animal. Clearly, some serious animal testing has been going on, and some will want to turn the film off right then and there, which they wouldn't be blamed for. We meet Sebastian Kane, played by Kevin Bacon. He's been working on something, and he just got his results. He calls his fellow scientist and ex-girlfriend, Linda McKay, who is played by Elizabeth Shue, who's home with her new man. She is not as excited about the middle of the night find, but she's definitely along for the ride. This leads to the quick intro of Matthew Kensington, played by Josh Brolin, who is also on the scientist's team. Everyone heads to the lab, and many animals are seen. Animal testing at its potential worst, given the type of film this is. There is a vet lady, Sarah Kennedy, played by Kim Dickens, who has the animal's backs as best she can. This is where the big sciencey stuff starts, and the film is filled with it. Oh, intro to another medical person, and he's played by Greg Grunberg, who just about everyone is familiar with now, or should be. They bring back the gorilla they had made invisible, but not without issues. Then a meeting with the government, who are the ones paying for these experiments. Kane lies to them, and they head back for human testing without proper approval. How could this go wrong, I wonder? You don't make history by following the rules. You make it by seizing the moment. Well, the story has a few questionable elements, including rape and a dog being killed manually on screen. That's funny, right? That alone will make some run in the other direction, and honestly, neither were necessary to establish the evil that Kane has become. You gotta stop this at any time! In terms of story, the film takes a few liberties in logic here and there, something that basically keeps it from being easily rewatchable. There's a lot of science scenes, and a lot of talking, and a lot of just a lot. The film is not bad, but it's not great either. When one thinks this is directed by the man behind Robocop, and Starship Troopers, it seems off. Elegant proof of intelligence, isn't it? Of course, if one goes to do a quick dive online, they'll find that even Paul Verhoeven is not all that happy with the film, which he took to keep active and keep working in the business, as some of his own projects had fallen through. He went on to say that, quote, I decided after Hollow Man, this is a movie, the first movie that I made, that I thought I should not have made. It made money, and this and that, but it really is not me anymore. I think many other people could have done that. I don't think many people could have made Robocop that way. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute! Or either Starship Troopers. Most of them are fresh out of boot. Or the old men ace. But Hollow Man, I thought there might have been 20 directors in Hollywood who could have done that. I felt depressed with myself after 2002. To say this is not his favorite of his work, would be an understatement, and it basically shows throughout the film. Everybody seems to have had that kind of fantasy or dream or whatever, and we all know it's completely impossible, but that doesn't prevent us to make a movie about it, isn't it? He was a director for hire, working on a script by Andrew W. Marlowe, and a story by Marlowe and Gary Scott Thompson. The film has some ideas that seem very logical, and some that are out of place. He did what he could with the film, but ultimately, it doesn't come off like one of his own, and it's possibly one of his lowest in the sci-fi genre. Keep looking at that hole, wondering if he's really there. Lead Kevin Bacon has said the film was hard on him, which he originally thought it would be almost all voiceover, but Verhoeven wanted him in the scenes to help the rest of the cast and crew with their performances. In an interview with EW, he told the publication that, quote, Verhoeven felt very strongly that he wanted me to use my body and the outline of my body and then have my voice rightly interacting with the actors so they had something to play with. Paul and the effects people were really experimenting with motion control cameras and motion control capture. Everyone's familiar with the green screen. Well, I was the green screen, so I was often covered in green with giant green contact lenses that covered my eyes and green mouth and green makeup all over and a green suit. It was long. 
and extremely hard to make. It was a tough one. One last kiss. For all time's sake. Elizabeth Shue, she was injured on set, and Verhoeven stopped production for weeks so that she could heal instead of recasting and reshooting what had already been done with her. She has said in interviews that she would have understood and respected the decision to recast. She had taken the part partially because of his involvement and because she could see where the script would go in the hands of such a director. Now, did the film do well at the box office? Yeah, it did quite well. I cracked the reversion. <laughs> you cracked it. The budget was 95 million US and it brought in 190.2 million US. So not a bad return on investment for anyone involved here. However, the film doesn't seem to have legs, and with reviews averaging a 26% on Rotten Tomatoes, the critics didn't seem to like it much. Really, Matt? 95%? That's not even worth my time. Christ. It's been called everything from vicious to brainless. The film is not the worst out there by any means, but it is not a Verhoeven film in terms of how it feels and how it comes off. While audiences went and saw it in theaters when it came out, most have forgotten it. I had forgotten about 90% of it between the original theatrical viewing and the new one done to write this. The film had simply vanished from memory. Now, looking at audience reactions to the film, it seems that they agreed with the critics and many also forgot the story and the details over the years. One saving grace for the film here are the effects. Even after 20 years, some of them still hold up. It's not all perfect CGI, of course, as CGI can age rather quickly, but the film still looks good. The disappearing and reappearing effects are still interesting, but effects alone do not make a film. The fact that 50 million of the 95 million of the budget went to the special effects shows on the screen. Reading about how these were made is interesting and shows a dedication to their craft by those artists and by the cast. Kevin Bacon was actually in most scenes where he is invisible, that when they shot without him there, the reactions of the others didn't come off authentic. So, into the morph suit, with its little tennis balls, went Bacon, and he was a professional about it, giving the film as good a performance as he could, which was then removed to make him invisible. And hey, don't ever, don't ever tell me how hard you have it. The special effects were done by two specific houses, Sony Pictures Imageworks, who did about two thirds of the work, and Tippett Studio, that did the rest. There are 560 visual effects shots total in the film, and each requires some multiple layers to be done, merging empty background shots, cast shots, and layers of special effects. These are still fairly impressive when watching the film on television. Oddly enough, this film is one of the rare few to be allowed to film right in front of the Pentagon, giving full view of the building. This is something that is rarely granted and somehow was allowed here even though the film shows military high rank approving of some of the experiments and then later getting involved when things go wrong. The film shot in part in Washington DC and in part in Culver City, California. The majority of the film was shot on sets and thus could easily be done away from the location it actually takes place in. Some of the outdoor scenes were shot in DC and that does help establish location and the story. This is something that doesn't really affect the story here but it's a fun tidbit of information. The film had some luck with locations, some bad luck with needing to stop production for a few weeks to be able to keep its leading lady. How bad? Bad enough to wake a few generals. But it also has a lot of small issues if one does their research. It has a ton of entries on IMDb under goofs, including factual errors when it comes to the science, a lot of continuity issues, character issues, plot holes, mistakes, and a ton more. The trivia page on there is filled with bits and pieces as this film has been looked at by so many over the years. Our research here could probably contain so much more information, but we decided to bring the most important bits to you.